best to be very brief tonight. The book of Thessalonians, I think it's 2 Thessalonians. A few weeks back, if you remember, I ran into this in my reading, and it was a blessing to me, and I hope it's been a blessing to you. I think we've preached now uh, twice on this text, and we've called the series of messages the importance of the grace of God. We looked at the salutation of Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm going to allow you just to stay seated and rest tonight. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 16, the Bible said, Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. How many believes God delights in his people having peace? and living at peace among themselves. I do too. I believe that's why the devil fights it so hard, amen? He he don't want peace in the home. He don't want peace in the world. He don't want peace in the church. Would somebody say amen? I mean, the devil just, whatever God delights in, the devil despises. He despises peace. The Bible said here, The Lord be with you all. And then he said, this is what grabbed my heart. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I thought it was interesting that the Apostle Paul, every one of his epistles, he closes out with a salutation of grace. I want to say this tonight before I pray. I believe every born-again believer, everyone that's ever experienced the grace of God desires that everybody experience the grace of God. Amen. Anybody's ever been to Calvary and knows what it is to get cleaned up, get lightened up, get the load lifted off of them, they, they just, I, I remember I shared with a man not too long ago that uh, I was saved when I was 27. And I said, he shared this with me too. We, he said, the only thing I thought was, why did I wait so long? I said, son, that's exactly the same thing I thought. This is so good. Why did I wait so long? Amen. And I know 27 is not very old, but I tell you, I told God, Brother John, I said, God, if you'll let me live 27 more years, I want to spend them serving you. I felt like I had wasted 27 years of my life. I thank God the Lord's let me live that 27 years plus. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for the privilege to be here in this place, for the reading of the word of God. Thank you for this man. Lord, we don't worship Paul. Paul wouldn't even put up with that. We worship Jesus. But Lord, it's good to read after this man, study after this man. and Lord, he helped the church so much in doctrine and instruction. And I pray, Father, tonight that as we try to honor this thought of the grace of God and the importance of the grace of God that you'd honor us tonight with your presence. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now turn back to 2 Corinthians. We've already looked at the last chapter in the book of Romans, the last chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians. I'd like to look at the last chapter in the book of 2 Corinthians tonight. We know that Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. We know that the Apostle Paul understood that the church at Corinth had a problem. And can I tell you this? If you ever find a church that doesn't have a problem, don't join it. Because they'll have one when you get there. Amen. But Paul understood that they were carnal. That there was divisions among them. And Paul... He didn't write them off. He wrote to them, and he tried to help them, amen, along the way. Let's, let's read in, in chapter 13, 
these last few verses, and then I'll preach a little bit in the chapter. The Bible said in verse 11, finally, brethren, farewell. Uh, I, I kid sometimes. People say, well, you say you're going to close, and it takes you 20 minutes. Well, Paul wrote two chapters after he said, finally, brethren. Amen. He said, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind. I believe that was in Timothy, by the way. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And all the saints salute you. Then he said, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So there's his salutation of grace. I penned down three words yesterday evening as I was studying and God helped me to develop it just a little bit this afternoon and I want to share that with you. The three words that I penned down that pertain to the grace of God is the word edification. I'll show it to you. The word examination and the word exhortation. I remember I, I've never experienced this myself but I've had men to tell me that in days gone by, there were men that said God didn't call them to preach, but they were exhorters. They would go in a revival meeting or go in a church. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, uh, and, 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 and they just would, would exhort the, the people and lift up Christ. And, and um, I believe that there, there ought to be exhortation, and we find that by the grace of God in this, in this chapter. I want you to look with me first at edification. There, where I got that from was in uh, verse 10. Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification. And I want you to see these last words and not to destruction. Now, God's man is going to preach. He's going to sometimes use sharpness and sharp words. Sometimes I guess the message is going to be harsh, but it's never, it's never intended, amen, to destroy, but it's intended to build up. It's intended to edify the saints of God. And we see, first of all, this edification is dealing with a warning. If you look in verse number of one and two of the chapter, Paul said, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. He said, I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come, I will not spare. Beloved, that word spare reminds me, I believe it's the book of Isaiah. The Bible said, lift up your voice and like a trumpet and tell the house of Israel their sin and my people their, their transgression. I forgot part of that. Spare not, cry aloud and spare not. That's what Isaiah was told of the Lord. And I'll be honest with you, and you all know I'm telling it right. There's not much crying aloud these days. Amen. And there's not much sparing not. Say amen. I'm telling you, the, the message has been trimmed to where there's almost not a message left. Amen. But God, Paul was God's man. And Paul didn't tell the church at Corinth what they needed to, or what they wanted to hear. He told them what they, they needed to hear. But what I want you to get in the back of your mind is... It's never aimed to destroy. It's always aimed to develop or to edify. I'm telling you, there's, got, there's been times in my ministry when I was just studying and God brought me out of my chair to my knees because before I could come and deliver what God had put in my heart, I had to get right myself. I believe that's the way the Word of God is, amen. The Word of God doesn't spare and we can just tiptoe through it if we want to, but we'd do well to listen to the whole counsel of God. So Paul is edifying. We see that in his warning. And in verse number 
10 where I just read, therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given to me to edification and not to destruction. The second thing I noticed in this edification was not only a warning. If we'll, if we'll be honest, beloved, we don't enjoy that. We don't enjoy being warned. I, our children don't enjoy being warned. I just found out the other day, well, just today I found out about it, but the other day I've got a granddaughter that's three years old and she's already learned how to tell whoppers. I mean whoppers, amen. She's already learned that you can take the toys from the Christian school and tell them that they're in your backpack when you got there and go home and tell mama that they gave them to me. <laughs> I'm talking about three years old. Now everybody knows where she got it. She got it from Miss Eve. Everybody knows, amen, it was passed on down, amen. But I'm telling you, her daddy didn't just warn her. Her daddy warmed her. Amen. Trying to teach her not to lie. Say amen. amen. Now, I'm not even sure what she's understanding right now. I got her up in my lap a while ago and I said, baby, I said, is your name Ava? She said, yes. I said, that's the truth, ain't it, ain't it? Right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I said, well, what if Papa said your name's Susie? She said, yeah. <laughs> I think anything just to keep from getting warmed again, <laughs> just agree with Papa. Amen. I'm not sure what she's understanding. But y'all will get a kick out of this. Her sister told her mama, said, Mama, she's lying. You can see it in her face. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Amen. I've said for years, if you don't believe in the sin nature, put two babies in one crib and give them one bottle, amen? And you'll find out something about the sin nature right quick, amen? One of them's liable to not come out alive, amen? And so the warning, that was edification. Then we see the weakness. You say, Pastor, why would you bring that out? Look at verse three. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. You say, you remember Paul was not much to look at. He was not much of stature. He was not a real strong man. And, and beloved, listen, what Paul is saying here, I'm giving you the warning. And you might think I'm weak. You might even question, if you look at the verse 3, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, you might even question my apostleship. But Paul realized that in his weakness, Christ's strength was made perfect, amen. And so he was able to edify them even in his weakness. It's mentioned again in verse number nine. The Bible said, for we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. So I guess they were probably running their mouths saying that little weak preacher, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you doubt if he, oh, I love what Brother Don said. Wasn't that good in the revival? Well, Brother Don said, the fellow come to him and said, the Lord told me your, your work here is done. Brother Don said, that's funny. He said, he ain't told me. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I, I, I like that. That's what's going on here at Corinth. They're, they're talking about, well, he, we don't even believe he's a preacher, let alone an apostle. Amen. Look how weak he is. But what they didn't understand was, Beloved, in his weakness, God was proving himself to be strong. And then it was for their well-being. The edification was a warning. It was delivered in weakness, but it was for their well-being. Look at verse 10. Therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Beloved, listen. Sometimes when you're trying to keep the youngins out from under the kitchen sink because there's chemicals under there that'll hurt them, they don't understand. Amen. Just a while ago, did y'all notice that Macy got a little bit discontent? You want to know why? She had it in her mind. I want that watch in my mouth. But I'm going to tell you something. That watch has been in Greece. That watch has been in diesel fuel this week. Amen. And I did not want that baby to have, on my best day, I don't want that watch in that baby's mouth. Amen. Yeah. 
And she didn't understand. Why won't he let me bite that thing? Amen? She didn't understand. And sometimes we don't understand. But God, if it's God's message, if it's God's man, God is just trying to help us. He's not trying to hurt us. He's not trying to destroy us. He's trying to develop us. Amen. It's for our well-being. Now watch the examination just briefly. We've looked at this before. In verse 5, if this, the grace of God, edification comes by grace. And examination, we're looking for grace. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? The Bible said in verse number 5, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves how that Christ, Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates. That word reprobates means disqualified. And beloved, I believe with all of my heart, it never hurts a faith, listen to me tonight, that cannot be tested, cannot be trusted. God has given us a faith that will stand the test. If that faith is real, you can examine it all you want to, amen, and it'll just keep popping up real, 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 real. But if that faith is not real, then, beloved, that too will pop up. So we need to look, at, beloved, at the faith that we have because of the grace of God and examine it tonight. Has our life changed? Do we have peace with God? Do we have the peace of God in our hearts and in our lives? Uh, you know, when we, we do wrong, does it bother us? Amen. I'm telling you, beloved, I believe it ought to bother a child of God. Amen. When they do wrong, and I believe it will, the Holy Spirit will see to it. And then it'll also, not only when we're looking for the faith, but we're looking, are we faithful? Look at verse 7 and 8. Now, I pray to God that you do no evil. And that reminded me of what Brother Mitchell said several times before he passed away in those last meetings that he had with us. He said, we're not perfect, but he said, we ought to strive for it. I like that, don't you? We shouldn't. The Bible said if a man's using the grace of God as a license to sin, he's in trouble, amen? You don't use the grace of God as a license to sin. It's liberty to serve, not a license to sin. So Paul said, now I pray to God that you do no evil, but that you should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. In other words, the way they were looking at him, he was disqualified, but we know that he wasn't. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. I tell you, if you're in the faith, there ought to be a desire to be faithful, to run from iniquity, to flee the very appearance of evil, the word of God said, that you do no evil, that you should appear approved. How many of y'all believe Jesus is coming? Amen. You know, there's two ways the believer can stand in that day when he comes. There's two ways. They're given in the book of 1 John. I think it's chapter number 3. We can stand before him with confidence or we can stand before him ashamed at his appearing. Now, I don't know about you, but I know the best of those two. I can remember when my dad would leave me a little chore like mowing the grass. And I can remember my dad coming in from work and nobody's truck sounded like daddy's truck. You say, Why? Because daddy didn't have the money to run down to the muffler shop. So when the muffler rotted off of it, Brother Larry, he just got up under it, took some inch and a half pipe, and went to welding. He run it up through the corners of the bed, and there wasn't a six-cylinder truck in the country that sounded like that truck. Amen. And daddy give you something. He say, son, mow the grass when you get in from school. And when I had done what daddy said, and I heard that muffler coming, I could sit there drinking a glass of tea and grin from ear to ear. Because daddy's going to get out of the truck and here's what he's going to say. Boy, the yard looks good, son. Thank you for helping me. You say, well, why didn't he mow it? He was going in the house, going to wash his face and shave again. He shaved twice a day. And he was going to sit down and eat a plate of food. And he was going back out to work till 10, 30, 11 o'clock that night. That's why daddy didn't mow the grass. And by the way, let me say this. Ain't nothing wrong with a teenage boy mowing the grass. Do I need to say that again? Ain't nothing wrong with it. Amen. 
We're not doing our children any favors, amen, if we do everything for them. They ought to have some responsibilities in their life. And I mean that tonight. So are we being faithful? Are we being faithful? When Jesus comes, we're not going to hear a muffler, but we're going to hear a shout. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God. We're either going to hang our head in shame or we're going to be able to say, there he is. I've been looking for him. I've been living for him. I've been loving on him, amen, believing that he's coming again. And so tonight, the last thing in the message, we see the edification in the closing out of the grace of God. We see the examination. It's by the grace of God we can be in the faith. It's by the grace of God we can be found faithful. But then we see the exhortation. That starts in verse number 11. Paul is exhorting the church at Corinth. As, as wicked as they had lived, the division. Uh, let me turn back here for just a minute. I didn't plan on doing this. I just want to show you. i show you. Turn to 1 Corinthians just a moment. 1 Corinthians back over there. I think it's uh, verse number 3. Uh, chapter number three, I'm sorry. Chapter number three of 1 Corinthians. And I, brethren, here's Paul talking to the church of Corinth, the same church, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. He said, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now. Are you able? He said, for you're yet carnal. For whereas there is among you, watch this, envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? What I'm trying to do tonight is magnify the grace of God and the apostle Paul closing out in the grace of God with this church. He said, for while one saith, I'm of Paul and another I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. I'll tell you in this church or any church, if there's anything good happening, it's him. He's the only one. Amen, that can do the work that needs to be done, whether it's in the child of God's life or in a sinner's life. He's the only one. Got no business running around saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. No, if you're not of Jesus, beloved, you didn't get in, say amen. And if we're of Jesus, there ought to be an exhortation. Watch what he said in verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. He's telling them bye. I got tickled. I'll say this again. Brother uh, Coulter, it's been several weeks ago now, I was talking to him. He's talking about going to a church. He said, that's going to be my first stop on my farewell tour. <laughs> that tickled me, amen. <laughs> and we're going to be his last stop on his farewell tour, amen. And uh, I tell you what, he's got to drive. He's got, I just had a good thought, Miss Eve. He's got to drive from here to Washington. And so... We, we might order to uh, get some of them throwaway styrofoam coolers and, you know what I mean, fix him up a little bit, amen. I sit down, fix him up, amen. That'd be good. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all, amen. What is, what is Paul exhorting here? Number one, he's exhorting them to be perfect. That word there, we know this. You can read the book of John, 1 John, is not talking about sinless perfection, but growing up, being mature in the things of God, amen. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind. You see, I wrote down the word for the sake of alliteration, be pleasant. You say, Pastor, why did you write that down? Because when I, said, when I read the, where the Bible said, 
be of good comfort, be of one mind. I was reminded of Psalm 133. The Bible said, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. That's what Paul wanted for the church at Corinth. He didn't want that division. He didn't want that envy. He didn't want that strife. He wanted to be able to look at the church and see that pleasantness among the people of God. So that exhortation is to be perfect, to be pleasant, to live in peace. The, the Bible said here, to live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. I'll tell you something tonight. Every one of us ought to desire that others know the joy of living Amen. in peace. Amen. I asked my youngins this morning in class, we were teaching on the subject of conflict. It's going to come. Somebody say amen. Whether it's at home or the job or church, conflict is going to come. And what, what really surprised me this morning, I guess in a way, is that I think, we, I, I'm trying to count, I think we had seven in the class this morning. And five of them within the last two weeks have experienced some kind of conflict in the last two weeks in their life. And we were teaching on that. So it's a blessing to see God's people live in peace. And then to top it all off now, the, the Apostle Paul says, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. If you drop down to verse number 14, he said the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and then he puts some icing on the cake and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all, amen. So not only is he exhorting them to be perfect and to be pleasant, to live in peace, but he's exhorting them to do these things that they might experience the presence of a holy God in their life. I tell you what we need in our home, Miss Eve, more than anything is his presence. What we need in our church more than anything is his presence. What we need, beloved, listen, in our country more than anything is his presence. I've said for years, and I believe it to be true, God can get more done in 30 seconds than I could get done in 30 years. We need his presence. Amen. How many believes tonight the grace of God is important? Paul signs off every epistle the same way. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's stand tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you for praying. Amen. I appreciate it so very much. Appreciate